Tonight I'm reading excerpts from Savage Ecology, War and Geopolitics at the End of the World by Jairus Victor Grove. This book is an attempt to make a certain kind of ecological sense out of 500 years of geopolitics and its warlike means. Here I develop a martial genealogy for what I am calling the Eurocene. In this story of development and expansion, geopolitics is not a cause per se, but it is a means that has been elevated and refined into a virtue. It is a means that has become its own ends. Because geopolitics is now a virtue, it succeeds and fails without much consideration for whether it should be abandoned. Consequences of a geopolitical form of life vary from settler colonial genocide to environmental massacre to strategic interventions into the very rhythms and synaptic terrains of individual human bodies. Yet at each interval of defamation, destruction, failure, renewal, re-entry, and invasion, geopolitics persists as the primary operating system of planetary life. The hope here is not to romanticize Earth's history of mass extinctions, but rather to displace the sociocentrism that in equal parts ignores the destructive geological power of the planet and the annihilations unleashed on human timescales by very particular humans. Rather than seeing apocalypses as inevitable, I read them as transformations or bifurcation points where other ways of life become possible. Savage ecology is also a martial theory of the Anthropocene. Throughout the book, I take the idea that we are in a planetary epoch in which the Anthropos is capable of making a scene quite seriously. An apocalypse is always more and less than an extinction, and whatever makes a life out of the mess we are currently in will depend, in some ways, on how we come to understand the contemporary condition. Ideas matter even if they cannot save us. Stories, explanations, and philosophical adventures are, in my estimation, the best of what the human estate has to offer. No matter how desperate things get, someone will still ask why this is happening, and we will share in that question the possibility of thinking together. Feral is not a way out of all of this, but rather a way through. I always feel more of a thing than I actually know of it, and I feel it otherwise than I know it. If a research agenda is driven by one's presumption of that which is to be studied, then we already find ourselves lost in our imposed telos of the research rather than the object of that research. To study the world as it is means to care for it. Take, for instance, the major studies of nuclear weapons. The presumed purpose of a nuclear weapon is to function, to deter, to launch on command, or even a launch on warning. We have many fine studies of how the nuclear arsenal is supposed to work, or more specifically, how we desire it to work. We have theories of nuclear decision-making, game theories of nuclear war fighting, psychological theories, and organizational theories. These studies, from John Steinbrunner's The Cybernetic Theory of Decision to Managing Nuclear Operations, are excellent analyses of hypothetical arsenals in coordination with either definitive human events such as the Cuban Missile Crisis or equally hypothetical scenarios of nuclear war fighting that double-click entirely of the actual process by which 6,000 or so weapons get deployed, targeted, launched, and detonated. The virtue of encounter as the driving force of thought is that it compels us to understand how little we actually describe, or much less comprehend, what nuclear weapons as an assemblage actually do. And that is not what we would like to do with them, but what they are. Delivery vehicles leak coolant, operators lose their minds, code command systems malfunction, and early warning systems misread solar flares, weather balloons, and even geese. Warheads get left armed and flown over friendly territory. Parts work, break down, and produce algorithmic anomalies. Yet how many great works of security studies or international relations are there on the history of accidents, near misses, organizational confusion, and failed tests? The vast reality of nuclear weapons finds almost no place in research about nuclear weapons. 
Despite the occasional consideration of a nuclear accident or an accidental nuclear war, real scholarship on the continent and even planetary-sized assemblages of computers, soldiers, technicians, enriched heavy metals, virtual monitoring and testing, trucks, railways, engineers, underground villages, hollowed mountains, theories of nuclear physics, chain of command, fear, regret, guilt, find almost no place in the theories of international relations, yet all of it is waiting for us on road trips, with every network dependent on daily ritual, in uranium tailings in the Native American reservations, and in the cancerous growth of loved ones. Concept creation, when combined with historical analysis and field research, can produce scholarship that is insightful beyond our ability to prove that it is insightful. The relational nature of change and emergence means that we must cultivate an attentiveness that might find the most interesting research agenda during a routine check at the airport, or in the repeated failure of your car's GPS near military facilities. Meaningfulness is a construction, but we are not the purveyors of its constructions. Without the blueprints, we have to creatively speculate about the conjunction of heterogeneous actors. I should read something about abduction next. Philosophy survives war, atrocity, famine, and crusades. Thinking matters in a very unusual way. Thinking is not power or emancipation. Thinking matters for a sense of belonging to the world, and for believing in the fecundity of the world despite evidence to the contrary. Savage ecology is for all the other wild animals out there studying global politics. May we be buried alive together. The 20th century was a Eurocentric project to finish the conversion of places and nature into a kind of de-differentiated user space. I would sum up my fear about the future in one word, boring. And that's my one fear that everything has happened, nothing exciting or new or interesting is ever going to happen again. The future is just going to be a vast, conforming suburb of the soul. J.G. Ballard The destruction of perspectives, whether it is those of poison dart frogs, sawfish, Navajo speakers, and pingo trees, bluefin tuna, isolated people of the Brazilian rainforest whose names belong to them alone, or artists and philosophers forced to abandon their creativity in favor of brain dulling, precarious labor, leaves this world less interesting and less complex than it was before. Homogenization entails a restriction of our socio-technical horizons. These include the North American beavers' river management practices and their ability to combat soil erosion, the duties of megafauna and apex predators to keep grazing creatures on the move and thus prevent overconsumption in prairie ecologies, and so on. The expanse of possible human-non-human alliances lost in the singularity of our current apocalypse is unknowable in an unusual way. The geopolitical advance of homogenization is killing futures as it strangles the present. To what date is it agreed to ascribe the appearance of man on earth? To the period when the first weapons were made. Henri Bergson Life and complexity run contrary to the principle of survival and stability. The technocratic managerialism of neoliberal states, a carbon tax here, a regulation on toxic pollutants there, is showing its insufficiency. A return to big ideas has a renewed cash. It would seem that only a TED talk can save us now. The horror show of the next century, if not derailed, will be entrepreneurs and resource tyrants all the way down. The fact that this horror show seems bigger than our political imagination, or more than can be overcome by the force of history, is no reason to look away and hope the old tropes of contradiction and declining profit will hold. In a short book entitled The Function of Reason, Alfred North Whitehead sets out to describe an urge or force that he believes distinguishes creative living things from other organizations of matter. Whitehead is unsatisfied with the functionalist Darwinian account of life in which accident merely selects organisms as fittest to survive. Whitehead sees neither fitness or u- nor utility in life, but creativity in the face of shocking fragility. According to Whitehead, from the perspective of deep time, life represents not the fittest of forms, but the most unlikely. 
as he sees it, that the cosmos was determined by the ability to endure the ravages of time, then it was rocks, not organisms, that were the obvious winners. Even within the kingdoms of plants and animals, surely complexity bears little survival benefit. In fact, unlike some bacteria, viruses, and fungi that can live indefinitely as complex organisms are much more vulnerable and persist in comparatively smaller populations. So rather than seeing an ascending line of organisms growing more complex to outcompete simpler adversaries, Whitehead sees complexity as an outgrowth of a rare aim toward novelty. He names reason as this aim. For we'll struggle to break out of equilibrium and fight against the current of entropy. While reason is not possessed by all things, the capacity is highly diffused. Reason is the counter-agency against the universal tendency of decay. What Whitehead is trying to describe is a weak but determinative force at work in those arrangements of things that strive toward greater degrees of complexity. Reason is not a necessary force, it is only a possible force. If it were a necessary condition of life, then we would be back in the realm of mechanism or physical law. For Whitehead, mechanism is a dead end. Unlike Darwin, Whitehead believes that any species once struggling towards complexity can stall or even reverse. Even highly complex species like humans are capable of sliding back into a kind of brute repetition that Whitehead calls fatigue. Creativity is a process in which we participate in uncanny ways rather than one over which we preside. It is therefore a process that upends the images of desire, will, agency, and intentionality often installed in negative and positive traditions of freedom. I guess that's why I felt like doing the nonsensical handwriting. We can't simply choose to be creative. An agent, individual, or collective can help to open the portals of creativity, but it can't will that which is creative to come into being by intending the result before it arrives. The creative element is located somewhere between active and passive agency. Interchangeably, Whitehead calls this thing that is between active and passive agency an urge or tendency. There has been a relapse into mere repetitive life concerned with mere living and divested of any factor involving efforts towards living well and still less of any effort towards living better. When any methodology of life has exhausted the novelties within its scope and played upon them up to the incoming of fatigue, one final decision determines the fate of a species. It can stabilize itself and relapse so as to live or it can shake itself free and enter upon the adventure of living better. When will you be overwhelmed by the fact that being so right makes so little difference? Much of humanity is stalled in vicious consumption of everything. The self-declared civilizational winners have neither a future nor a wild spirit. We need a new social science, an uncivilized social science committed to a feral reason that is endemic to this world rather than the cold consciousness of a supposedly independent human mind or exclusively social sphere. Something other than a discursive politics among communicating individuals needs to open up to forces that are not our own, to consider the elemental and inhuman so that it might be possible to think what life may be worth living on. Such an approach would require a thought of the cosmos, of life and its durations. That would be destructive of the polity. That would not return all the elements and forces into what they mean for us. Contra the dream of becoming data or some other silicone life form, the problem isn't the technological limitations of space exploration, geoengineering, or even digital existence. It's the belief that one of these options can escape this world. The recent discovery of electron-eating bacteria is just one more reminder that there is no jailbreak from this mortal coil. It is decay all the way down. Those who see an eternal future in technological dominance or digital life without death are like Nietzsche's fools who will create a philosophy of imminence and abundance with a mood of optimism. Instead, we must find our meaning in rougher waters. To lead a good life, it is first necessary to enjoy living on the edge. 
If Earth's calamitous and creative history teaches us anything, it's that those who survive and thrive are not the fittest or even the survivalists. They are those creative forms of life that intensify their existence, even if that intensity is only fleeting. In a creative cosmos, we must speciate often and wildly, lest we find ourselves without reason to live, much less the ability to continue. To put it another way, we should fear fatigue, not oblivion. How do we go wild without the cruelty of indifference? This is what I am trying to begin, a search for a sober apocalypse, a slow apocalypse. A confrontation with perishing finitude and fragility, but one that fills us with at least as much wonder as dread. More political energy than resignation, and take seriously that apocalypses are not ends, but irreversible transitions. These events punctuate our cosmic epic. As events, they are sometimes catastrophic, sometimes tragic and cruel, and sometimes generative. Tomorrow morning, he decided, I'll begin clearing away the sand of 50,000 centuries for my first vegetable garden. That's the initial step, Philip K. Dick. Era has transformed animals into men. Is truth perhaps capable of changing man back into an animal? Nietzsche. Human, all too human.